accent and this mask will make it hard to understand what I'm saying. Anyway, all the notes though are online. And if you go in the workshops on the website under my name, I have the notes for every workshop I've given. Now, why, how am I qualified to talk about this? I've been taking 3D pictures for 35 years. I've taken thousands <coughs> of pictures, but I've also seen pictures that others have taken. I see them every day, I judge very often. So I have a general idea of what you can do. I can offer you some tips for improving your stereo photography. Next. There are three stages in the picture taking process. What happens before, what happens during, and what happens after. Usually we focus what happens during, but the before and after are also part of the photographic success. So here are my 18 tips that I put together. I'm going to go through each one. Let's start from the before. Number one says, be there. That sounds like a, kind of a joke. Like, if you're not there, you're not going to take the pictures, right? But I'm going to tell you a little story. Next. Back in uh, October of 2018, my phone rings at 9 AM, and my good friend, Ursula Grinko, says to me, let's go to the Wendy, Wendy Park in Cleveland to take pictures of the butterflies. What was happening, the monarch butterflies, they have an annual migration cycle. They migrate from Canada to Mexico during the winter, and then during the fall, they migrate back. What? I think I reversed that. It's spring. Okay. Anyway, we went in the fall, and the butterflies are flying from Mexico, from Canada to Mexico. They pass this through big a uh, body of water called Lake Erie. And when they land in Cleveland, they stop in this windy part that they like. And if the and to refresh and refuel, if the weather is not very good, as was happening this year, they stay overnight for a couple of days, more butterflies are coming, and then creates a large accumulation of butterflies. Now, I have nothing going on this morning, but my response was this one. <laughs> I'm busy. Uh, Okay, and then an hour later, the phone rings again, and Ursula said, I'm at Wendy Park, and it's just amazing. You gotta come. I said, okay, I'm coming. I grabbed my cameras, I went, and I'm glad I did, because what happened next? I took, okay, here you can try your three glasses. So I went there, and I'm glad I did, for three reasons. I took some great pictures of the butterflies. I put together a sequence that I entered in the PSA exhibition, sequence exhibition for the Graphic Society of America, and I won second place. And most important, I learned in the process of creating the sequence, I learned quite a bit about this very interesting natural phenomenon. Next. So if you have a hard time being there, I have some tips for you. The first one is you can join groups that do photography. And I have to tell you, I've been coming to NSA for many years, and for a long time I didn't do anything. I stayed in my room. I saw things, I went to the Cerro Theater, I did participate in social events or excursions. Well, 10 years ago, this changed, and now I've signed up for every excursion at NSA. And actually, the main reason I'm coming to these things is so I can go out with people and groups and take pictures. Change your attitude. I don't know if you, have you seen the, the movie Yes Man? Yep. Oh, it's a very funny movie. So, he got in a spell where he couldn't say no, he could only say yes, and very good things happened to him. And I suggest you do the same. Instead of saying uh, no, just always say yes. And last one, a little bit of self-motivation. I started doing a night photography, and like I'm here at the convention, I have dinner, and I'm tired. And I'm thinking, oh, no, I have to pack my stuff, go out. It's not, it's not safe. Maybe it's too hot. It's too cold. There's always an excuse. But think about the nice pictures <laughs> you're going to take, and that hopefully will self-motivate you. 
Next. A couple of years ago, I wrote an essay called F8 and Big Hair. And by the way, all those essays and articles have been published in the CD that our club is offering for sale. It's 35, it's not, how many? 26 years of, of stereo tutorials. So the phrase F8 and be there is attributed to this guy who was a street photographer in New York in the 1920s. When he was asked about the secret of his photographic success, he said F8 and be there. So we talked about being there. What does the F8 really mean? Well, maybe for him it meant something practical, but for us now it means be prepared. Have your camera set at F8, maybe pre-focused, you are ready to take pictures. So that's the next thing I want to tell you, to make sure you are prepared. And I broke it down into three things. Do a little bit of research. You're coming to Buffalo, New York. Uh, look at some pictures online, what kind of pictures people have taken in this place. Second, bring all the equipment you might need and some extras because, <laughs> like, I do this all the time. I said, I'm not going to need this. So I don't take my tripod, I don't take my macro, and then I go there. Wow, there's the butterflies. I need a tripod to do some night photography. So just throw it in the car if it's not a problem. And the last one, let me ask you this. This has happened to you. You go out to take pictures, let's say you're Fuji, you turn it on, like nothing happens. You look and there's no battery. Or you get a message, no SD card. Well, you left the battery on the charger, for example. That happened to me. Somebody told me this tip. He says, before you leave, turn the camera on, or the camera's on, and make sure everything's OK. Take a test picture. That will show you a few problems. I have to tell you a story. Uh, there's a friend of mine. I'm not going to tell you his name, but he's the president of NSA. <laughs> so he told me. <laughs> he, went, he went for a strenuous hike for half an hour to reach those waterfalls. He got there, put his two cameras on the tripod, turns them on, takes a picture, and then it'll go beep beep, battery exhausted. <laughs> he didn't have any spare batteries, he hiked all the way back, no pictures. He failed in three fronts. He failed to charge the batteries overnight. He failed to do this, this uh, check test before he left. He would have noticed that the batteries are very low. And then he didn't have extra batteries with him, but he should have. So don't be that guy, right? Be prepared. <laughs> OK, next. Oh, here we went to Mount Rainier last year. So you go to a place like this. Uh, so we're set, again. <laughs> Mount Rainier. Sorry, thank you. I have the little subtitles. I don't know if you can see yeah, them. Thank you. He, uh, so before you go to a national park, you can look pics online. You can do some research. What are the best trails? <coughs> and while you're there, you can ask the rangers, uh, what's a good place to take pics of the sunset, for example? Also a question, are there going to be any wildflowers while I'm there? These are things that you can research before time. Make sure you're prepared. Next. I like this picture. This is your captain. I knew I was going to get in the cockpit of a plane. And I, if I had my Fuji, it's not going to work well because the place is very crowded and dark. So I need the smallest spacing, small enough, wide angle lenses. and. The Samsung NX1000 gave me that, and I bounced the flash. So I can prepare with the right equipment, and I think I took a decent picture of this challenging photographic situation. Next. OK, now um, <clears throat> we keep moving here. We're going to what happens during the shooting. <coughs> First thing, stay alert, keep thinking, and be ready to take pictures. Very simple advice. Next. I was walking in Chicago with my cameras, and I look up and I see this flock of birds. You only have a second or two to take this. I was ready. I took it. Next. Here, I was in Nashville. And early in the morning, I, I went taking pictures in the bridge that you see in this picture. And then I drove my cameras, and I went running. And I, I found out I can use another bridge. As I was running, the sun comes out, and I, it's beautiful. And I'm thinking, I don't have any cameras with me. Damn. But, however, I do have a camera. I do have this, my phone. So this is a hyper stereo. Don't think, I don't have anything. I'm lost. Forget it. You have your phone. 
So I captured this hyperstera while I was running on the bridge. Okay, next. This is a similar situation. In last year's NSA convention, I found myself in a butterfly house. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. I didn't have my camera. I wasn't prepared. <coughs> but I see Robert Bloomberg. You know Bob Bloomberg? Yeah. He was using his phone to take to do chats out of the butterflies. I said, can you do that? He said, sure. They're not moving. You know, you can do it. So I took this one with my phone. And it turns out this one first place in Ohio this season and it was also published in Stereo World. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Next. Here, my wife is driving in California, and when my wife is driving, I only just try, I look around and I have a camera ready to take sequential pictures while the car is moving. So I took this interesting landscape, I don't know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Random landscape in California <coughs> turned out pretty good from a moving car used for your stereo base. So think of all those opportunities that might arise. Next. Uh, this advice says when you take pictures, you should move around. You can change the distance to your subject. I don't know if you realize this, but the distance to the subject is the most important stereoscopic variable because it affects three things. If I come closer, the near objects become larger. The perspective, which is the ratio of the near to far, intensifies, also becomes larger. And the stereoscopic deviation how much depth there is also becomes larger. If I move closer, if I move back, everything is reduced. So instead of staying still and taking a picture, try moving around, back and forth, and also change the angle of view. Don't shoot always looking straight, look down, look up, put the camera lower, shooting up. Actually, I gave a whole presentation mm -hmm. next year at the NSA on unusual perspective next, which is exactly this topic. This is Vinny, the world's most famous dog in 3D. It's not my dog, it's the neighbors. But I take him every day for a hike, so instead of just shooting people or animals up looking down, try putting the camera on the ground looking up. Next. I was out with my friend Ursula, and we're in the train station, so she puts the cameras on the floor. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> she said, don't worry. Okay. Then she comes up with this. Uh, this is great because if she had shot this at eye level, half of the picture would be the floor, which is totally uninteresting. So she put the camera on the floor, and now you have the geometric pattern, the clouds in the back, create a great picture out of a situation where, you know, I didn't see any picture opportunity. Next, we're just in a corridor. Here I put the camera up and photographed my family looking down, a little bit of an unusual perspective for a selfie. Next. At the 2015 NSA convention in Utah, you see a lot of people are doing funny things. But by the way, I have to tell you, we're all kind of older people here. I've started going to yoga classes, yoga classes, so <laughs> when I do this, I'm able to get up again, you know? <laughs> okay, next. This is what these guys were photographing in Utah. Next. Now there's this guy, I met this guy at the PSA conference years ago and he sold some great, he's a 2D photographer, but he had this very unusual perspective picture. So I talked to him and I said, you know, I like the picture where you took all those people looking up and he says to me, I had to dig a hole. I said, what? He says, well, I was using a film camera. In order to compose, I had to be behind the camera and the only way to do that is to dig a hole. I was like, whoa. And then he said up, he climbed on a tree and he was chased by monkeys, he fell from the tree. I mean, all the stories, for what? To take a more interesting perspective. Now, I don't want you to risk your lives to do that, but you can see at what extent some people will go to get the unusual perspective. Next. The, leg, the next series of tips deal with the light, direction, quality, and the weather. <coughs> Let's see number five. Number five says, instead of going out and shooting everything at noon. Yes, yeah, okay, next. Uh, try earlier or later in the day. This is sunset in Costa Rica, and if you take this picture at 12 noon, it's gonna be a, a record shot, basically, but in the afternoon, it becomes an interesting picture of the two people there that see they are to be interested. Next. I was, I'm getting advertised on Facebook. This guy is a photographer, he says, sign up for my workshop. I look at the pictures he's showing, 
and all of them are like early or late light. Now it's like at noon. Look at them, you know? If you go to a store, buy pictures of buffalo, you notice that most of the successful pictures are taken <coughs> at our late in the day or early in the day. Next. The light is definitely better. There's something called the golden hour. You can Google see exactly what it means, the time before and after the sunset or sunrise. And here are some tips for doing a golden hour photography. There are apps, actually. If you don't know what time the sun is setting here, you want to go out, there are apps you can use, figure it out. Also, right here, if you read those online, it says, um, be prepared because the light changes fast during this time. I tell you what happened to me last year in Tacoma. I, I'm outside and I look and I see Mount Rainier. The sun has set in the city, but Mount Rainier was glowing, glowing orange. And I said, wow, this is great. Let me take this. So I, I started putting some tripod, da, da, da. 20 seconds later, I look up and say, it's gone. <laughs> the sun has set in Mount Rainier. Like, I missed it, you know? It's always a matter of less than a minute that the light has changed. So be prepared when you see the light to take the picture. Next. There's also something called the blue hour. <coughs> I don't know if you heard this term, the blue hour. After the sun has set, for the next hour, if you take pictures of the sky, the sky is going to be blue. And a little bit later, even if you, in your eye, the sky looks dark, if you take a long exposure, the sky will be blue. And that's a good time to take pictures like this. This is Tacoma at night. I use my twin Sony cameras over a bridge and I took a long exposure of the traffic and I thought it turned out pretty well. Next. Also the direction of light. We have the tendency to always shoot with the light behind us. Try with the light in front of you. This is a little bit challenging for your equipment. You have to have good lenses. And next. Uh, here's my wife out on a foggy morning. There's the weather element here that adds more interest in the picture. There's fog. Now, instead of staying home, next, try uh, taking pictures in bad weather. This is uh, outside in my theater, and I think the rain adds more interest to this picture. And by the way, I have to tell you, when I first started posting pictures of birds, uh, it was during the winter. So I was shooting them in, from inside the house behind glass because it was too cold. So I said on Facebook, uh, I, I told people what I did. So this guy says to me, George, from all the people in the world, <laughs> you are a trail runner. You run during the winter. You run in snow, rain, ice, you know, the elements don't matter. And you tell me you're afraid <laughs> it's too cold to go outside and take pictures. My first reaction was I tried to defend myself. And then I realized this guy is right. <laughs> You know why? Because trail running in Ohio, there is nothing like bad weather. The runners say it's never <coughs> too cold to run. It's only not dressed appropriately. In this race here, <coughs> the temperature at the start was minus 5F or minus 20 degrees C. The race is not canceled. You just put more clothes on. Next. This is one of my favorite pictures of Brandywine Falls at Cuyahoga National Park, that's only half an hour, 20 minutes from my house, taken during the winter. Next. Oh, a winter portrait of Vinny. I remember that day, it had snowed a lot during the night, and we thought maybe we shouldn't go on a trail today. We decided to go, and while we were about one foot <coughs> in, we immediately regretted our decision, <laughs> because the snow was so heavy, we could barely move, and now we have a so it's go back or go forward. We decided to go forward. Very slowly we made it. But that was the day I took this lovely portrait of Vinny during the winter. Next. By the way, just the other day, I was reading this book here. Are you familiar with this book? Maybe you'll find a copy for sale. This guy is in, was in the Netherlands. He's known as a technical writer. Everything is technical, right? And all of a sudden, I find a chapter about lighting, lighting. He says the lighting of the subject, I mean, in this few paragraphs, he summarized the whole essence of what I'm trying to say. The lighting is important. You should not look at your subject always with the sun behind, blah, blah, blah. You know, what if the sun is not shining? Then that might be the best time to take pictures. How about raining? Oh, perfect. 
catching the, la the right atmosphere on your photo will give you lasting satisfaction. I really couldn't have said this any better. And this guy supposedly is a technical writer, but clearly he understands about the importance of life. Next. Now, <clears throat> some of us use, take macro pictures and we use a flash, artificial light. When you do that, instead of always having the flash on the camera, try to use it creatively. Uh, by changing the direction of the light, you can create different effects. So you should experiment with this because you have the chance. Next. I'll give you an example. This one is taken in my backyard. Those raindrops, if you photograph them forward, they kind of disappear. If you throw the light from the side, they pop up. Next. The difference between front lighting and back lighting, you see? Very interesting. Next. One of the best things I've done, really, is to use this flux. Now, there's this flux has two flux heads, and now there's a version of three flux heads. And I have a few of these for sale. Uh, what this does is, you put this on your camera, and then you move the flashes around, and you can put one behind your subject, one on the side, in the front, or two on the side. So it's an easy way to direct the light in different directions. Now, you don't have to use this. You can use one flash on the camera, small triggering, some fl sleigh flashes. You can make other arrangements. <coughs> but just don't have one light source on the camera. Try to have them off the camera and more than one if you can do it. Next. So I'm walking down my street and I see this kind of weed. You look at it, it doesn't, it doesn't look interesting. Then I take a picture with the light a little bit behind and it's like, ooh, that's interesting. And there's a little bug there that adds more interest. Next. This photograph at my dining table, so you don't have to be anywhere special, but I think the light makes it more interesting. Next. Well, I have this Panasonic 3D lens, and I have one for sale, just one. And uh, I can use it to take portraits, but what makes this portrait interesting is that I use a flash. I was at the NSA convention, or 3D weekend. This guy is here at the convention and he's giving a workshop too. It looks like it's exactly this is my setup. Next one. This is my setup. <coughs> I come close to the subject. I have, I have studied this a little bit. One flash a little bit forward, the other flash on the side. And even though the room is bright, the end result looks like a studio shot. Next. Were you using the center third flash? Pardon? Did you use the center third flash, the LED? No, this one did mm -hmm. not have, only had two. This is bark. Our beloved register. register. Uh, taking at a club meeting, I put the flash down. Very interesting uh, direction. More interesting than a common uh, portrait. Next. Okay, number nine. Use props. What is a prop? A prop in photography is an object added to create more interest, right? Something that deliberately you added to the picture. Now the best use is in tabletops, but I'll see you. I'll show you how you can use it for other things too. I belong to a club in Ohio and one in the Detroit. We have assignments. You know what assignment means? Means they tell you to photograph a specific subject. And our assignment in Ohio was yellow. Yellow. Okay. So a lot of people thought about photographing a lemon, right? <laughs> I did this as an experimentation, and even though. The light is nice, you know, everything is good. It's just a lemon in the eyes of the judges. It's a lemon. Now let's see what some other people did. John Bisi, oh, okay, he asked me a picture of him, so here's one. He put a bunch of lemons on a ball, put a dramatic side lighting, photographed so that it can come out of the stereo window. You have a more interesting picture, won an award. And Ursula, not to be left out of the party, she created an adult lemonade. Lemonade. So if you look at this picture, everything here is, a, is like a prop. The party atmosphere, the lens. <coughs> Next. Is there a prop used here? Yes, the water. The water. The water drops, yes. This is an old timer tip. <coughs> uh, when you photograph flowers, have a little bowl <laughs> to spray water because everything looks better with a little uh, water droplets. Next. Now, a lady with a hat on the boat. Well, you can, even though I didn't deliberately add those elements, 
the hat, the glasses, the earring, whatever, they're kind of props. They are more interested in a portrait. Next, the smoking lady on the same boat. Now, by the way, I photograph those with my Sony RX10. So I'm on the other side of the boat. They have no idea they're being photographed. Sounds a little bit creepy, but these are all friends. <laughs> these are friends of mine. They're not totally strangers. But it's nice that the subject is not fully aware that it's being photographed, so they don't do, uh, try to smile and do things like that. Now, I, this picture, this is funny. 50 years ago, it was classic photographing people holding a cigarette. <laughs> now it's a big no, 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 but still creates an interesting picture. Next. In this picture, at the uh, Sequoia National Park, my wife is a pro. Now, don't tell her I said that, but if I have taken this picture without a person there, you won't have any idea of the scale. You're lost. By putting a person, now you get a scale. So the person is adding to the picture. The only change here, I should have asked my wife to look up. Instead of looking straight at the camera, ask people to look somewhere else on the point of interest, like up. Next. I have been uh, using a book written in the 1950s, and I've gotten some tips out of this. So here, the, the guy, in a very small booklet, discusses how to deal with people in scenic pictures. He says, don't do that. This, you don't know, is the scenic shot, is the portrait, a combination of the two. If you're really going for a scenic shot, your subject should not be more than, it should be less than one quarter of the height of the frame, should be looking at the center of interest, not the camera. The book is in black and white, so I have to be preferably wearing red clothes that give contrast with the green foliage. Next. This picture here, tourists in Washington DC, people complain there are too many people that couldn't take a good shot. Well, how about using your, the people as part of the overall composition? Next. Uh, let's go to tip number 11. Now, people is your subject. How are you going to photograph people? My advice is to avoid group monotony. This is me in 1997, and our co-founder of the Ohio Club, somebody <coughs> took this picture, were facing straight, you know, smiling. The other picture here, I was at the club meeting, this is funny, and I told this guy and his son, can I take a picture of you? So he grabbed the stereo ward out of the tape, just a minute, he grabbed the magazine, I didn't tell him to do that. He opens the magazine, pretend he's reading, and it around with his son, smiling, and that created a more interesting picture than just standing and looking at me. Another advice, if you want to photograph people, is you have to be confident, okay? Make it clear that your interest is in photography. Pretend that you know what you're doing. <laughs> That's a good one. And don't be shy. Don't be shy, but show them, you know, you know what you're doing, you're the boss. Let me give you an example here. I was, I was running on a trail with Ursula, a trail run, and all of a sudden we see a horse coming. Now, the etiquette is you always stop the horse. So we stop, and then I, I had my ego camera, and I said, can I take a picture? I said, yeah. So I snapped this picture, and then we keep going on the trail. So Ursula says to me, well, that was creepy. So I said, what do you mean? Well, don't say, can I take a picture? Like, okay, tell, tell her a little bit. Oh, you know, I'm a stereo photographer. I love horses. And then, you see this picture of Phil, the horse turned its head, just move around, make sure the horse looking at you, go a little bit lower, you know, take a few pictures, don't take a picture, run away. <laughs> and in contrast, next one, Joel B.C., he said he was walking on the trail during Halloween, and he saw those ladies that had, were all dressed up, and they were doing their own picture taking. And he says to them, you know, hey, I'm a stereo photographer, he's the master, he's the master of people photography very confident, and people obey him, they <laughs> lined up for him so he can take the shot. Instead of being creeped out there, they posed for him. I, I was at the zoo, this was a little bit better for me. I, I was taking a picture of this family and they asked me, what are you doing? So I gave them my Fuji to see the picture in 3D, and while they were doing this, I pulled out the Panasonic 3D1 and I took this picture. Okay, we're tip number 12, and this is ED problems. And here ED does not stand for erectile dysfunction, but it's something, it's something equally bad that I see every day in our club, excessive deviation. Let me tell you, as a judge, as I said, every day I see images 
that had deviation from 10 to 20 percent. Now there is a recommendation, there is a recommendation or hobby that says the maximum deviation should be 3 percent. Now that recommendation is not written on stone, but there is a reason for that. And instead of 3, I see 10 to 20. Now excessive deviation creates problems. The images cannot be fused. To give you an example, if you have 10% uh, deviation on a 50 inch display, which is a typical TV, creates 5 inch deviation. While our eyes are two and a half, the, the separation on the screen is, is 5 inches twice, so your eyes will need to divert. So you might not be able to do that, so you don't fuse the infinity. And then they create something called ghosting instead of projection. <coughs> if things are far away, they're different in contrast, one leaks through the other channel. Now, I have to tell you that deviation is a real quantity that you can measure, and you don't need a degree in math or physics to figure it out. And I'm going to show you an example. This picture here, next, was taken by Lee Pratt. You have a little bit of a trouble. You see ghosting. It's hard to fuse. Well, look at the clouds in the back. So what I did is I <coughs> measured the separation of the clouds. I divided by the size of the screen. And I came with 7.2% deviation. It's that simple. So I give you here the procedure. If you use stereo photo maker, like a lot of us do, you move, you hit the left arrow. Okay, You move the picture in anaglyph mode, so the two pictures overlap. Then you hit the left arrow until something that you want to measure the deviation, in this case, the clouds overlap. While you do that, there are two numbers here. The x number was 0, and by the, when it overlaps, it says 142 pixels. You move. Then you look up here, and you see what was the size in pixels? 1920. So you divide 142 by 1920, and you get this number, 7%. So you know that the deviation is twice the recommended. So you should be careful. Check this out. Next. How do you control this? Well, <coughs> do not come too close to your subject. This is what causes the excessive deviation. So it's better to step back, zoom if you want, crop later. There's a rule of thumb. You have to stay 30 times your stereo base, distance of the lenses. When you mount your pictures, pay attention to the stereo window because this can make things worse or better in terms of deviation. And then you, there are ways to measure it. And also you should think about bracketing the deviation. Let me show you this. Uh, if you use a phone app called Steroid, uh, actually it will give you the deviation. If you take a stereo pair with your phone, it will give you the deviation, 2.1%. So I know I'm below the 3% maximum. I was in Greece in Meteora, and I had my camera, and I was faced next with this beautiful uh, view <coughs> from the street of the monastery. So I take the camera and I move like five steps. I take another picture and I was doing this for a while. I was very happy. And all of a sudden I thought, wait, maybe that's too much. Why don't I measure it? So I pull out my phone and I take a picture and then I move five steps. I take another picture. I see the deviation was 10%. Uh oh, I blew it. I mean, if that's all I took that day, I failed basically. So then I took maybe one step and that was giving me two and a half percent. I said, this is all I need, one step. And this code came out. There's a guy, there's a guy uh, in Europe, not many people know him. His name is Matez Bohak. And he's not on Facebook, he's nowhere really in social media. He doesn't enter any competitions. But I have a viewer, I'm going to show you later at the trade show, uh, some of the beautiful pics he takes, particularly his hyperstairs. His hyperstairs are always at the perfect amount of depth. So I asked him, I said, what's your trick? How do you do those? Next. What's your secret? Producing pictures that look like good aviation, hyper stereos. Next. And he told me, next. His secret is not a secret <coughs> because he published back in 2017, he published an article in a magazine called Stereoscopy. That's the magazine of the International Stereoscopic Union. Currently, I'm the editor. I was in the editor in 2017. But he published an article called Less is More, Keeping the Deviation Under Control. And that's his name, if you want to see it written. He's in Czech Republic. He said, he puts his camera on one tripod. One, he only carries one tripod. He puts a camera on the tripod. He composes. He tries to remember the composition. 
Then he takes a second camera. This is a twin camera hyperstereo connected with a cable. He said there's a cable that has almost 20 meters. So he makes an estimate what the stereo base would be. That's his estimate here. And then he brackets this. He goes more or he goes less. And then when he goes home, he looks at all the pictures and see which one works the best. Usually he says it's less. Always his estimate usually tends to overestimate how much base he needs. Actually, I tried this system last <coughs> night. I was in Niagara Falls and I was walking this bridge that goes from Canada to the United States. And he had a view of all the uh, falls. But I had a friend of mine. <laughs> He's my tripod. So and I, look, I told him, stay there, you know. I went far away, connected the cable. I, he says, well, what should we aim? That's important. I said, yeah, you know, you see this tower right there? Aim exactly at the tower, at the center. And I did the same thing. Of course, the alignment is not going to be perfect, but stereo photo maker or other alignment programs will correct that. So that's the secret here. I'm mm -hmm. talking about <coughs> this thing, br a bracket. The stereo base is something that should you think about bracketing, number 13. Let's move to tip number 14. It says, do not compose <coughs> time. Well, I have this unfortunate habit developed after 20 years of film photography, where whatever you see is what you're going to get. So I do the same with digital camera. They compose too tight. That's a mistake because there are operations, alignment operations, that will remove part of your image. So if you, if you compose too tight, you might lose a critical part of the picture. You can always crop. You cannot bring back something that was cropped out. Next. When I got my uh, eco camera, this is my wife and Vinny. Boy, Vinny's a star again, huh? Mm -hmm. So I, when I was looking at this, his call was in the picture. I composed, it was in the picture. But my camera has a 50 pixel uh, vertical deviation. And the side that the camera is showing me, unfortunately, is the side that is the lower one. So after I aligned it, it was cropped. I shouldn't have composed so tight, then it would have stayed in. Next. The next tip is to take notes. Some, you think you're going to remember everything, especially if you plan to make a program. You might not know, remember where you are. So occasionally, when there's a sign explaining what you see, objects are identified. I used to take a 2D picture with my phone. Then at some point, I thought, I thought why don't I take a 3D picture? <laughs> I might use this in the program. So that identifies the location and the different features in the picture. Next. So now we're done with before <coughs> and after. We're going to discuss what before and during. We're going to discuss what happens after. This is a big advice here is don't delay, organize. So you come back from this convention and you have like 500 pictures, 1,000. My advice to you is work on them right away. Move the, the pictures from the memory cards to the computer, preview, align, organize the pictures in folders, select your best ones. If you don't do this right away and you wait, eventually you're going to lose interest and you might never get back to doing it. You will forget important things that were happening while you were taking pictures. So you need to do this very quickly. Number 17. You should do some basic 3D editing, align, crop, adjust the stereo window, and number 18, some basic 2D editing on your best pictures maybe, make them look better. Next. I want to talk about the importance of cropping. It's a very powerful tool. We didn't have this option when we were shooting slides, but now we do. So you take a picture like this, and there's a distraction here, and the subject is too centered. If you crop it like this, you eliminate the distraction and you improve the composition. That's what cropping will do for you. Now, cropping will not change the relationship between objects. So you have to be careful in the first place how you compose. But it can make things better after you've taken the picture. Next. Remember the uh, winter portrait of Vinny? That's the original picture that I took. I turned around, I see Vinny was running at me, and I thought that looks good, I took this picture, and the next, I blew it up and I cropped the face. And you might say, well, I see some snow here I didn't see in the first picture. That's because I adjusted the contrast and brightness a little bit. So as a result of cropping, I generate an interesting picture out of not so interesting one. Next. 
Here's another one. Vin is playing. This is the original picture photographed with my Sony cameras. By the way, if you want to see the cameras that took <coughs> the last two pictures, these are my latest. I talked about this in my last uh, workshop on twin cameras. These are my Sony RX1 bottom to bottom. Instead of putting them horizontal, I put them bottom to bottom so that the spacing is 66 millimeters. It's normal. That gives me a vertical, or an, I use an aspect ratio of one to one, which means I, I throw away, I throw away half of my picture, but I don't care. It gives me like a square like this, pretty much. And then look what I've done. Boom, right? I enlarge by four times. So this would be equivalent to using 135 millimeter lenses. This camera is fixed, fixed. I cannot change this lens, 35 millimeter lenses. But by, by cropping, and having the ability to do that using these high resolution cameras, I get something that will be equivalent to using a longer focal length lens. Next. I actually do something called extreme cropping. <laughs> when I look at a picture instead of Photomaker, I hit the, the shortcut, there's a shortcut J. If you hit J, the picture enlarges to the resolution of your screen. <clears throat> so I hit J and then I move the picture around and occasionally I find something interesting. I'm ready to delete. I say, this is not good. I'm deleting it. Wait, just a minute. Hit J. Whoa, look around. Whoa, look at this. I found a picture within a picture. And then if you want to go back to full screen, hit F. Next. So I took this picture of the train. The train is coming. The train is far away. I look at it. There's not much of interest here. A lot of pictures of trains. So <laughs> this is not very interesting. But I decided to blow it up. Next. And somewhere there, I found this. Now, there is no, uh, the road is not there, and the train is coming, the headlights are pointing at me, emerging out of the woods. I really like this. <coughs> and in this case, it's as if I use 170 millimeter lenses. Next. Just to show you, this is the original one, and this red square is the crop I end up doing. Now, if I wait a little bit later, a little bit seconds later, the train has turned, I don't see the headlights. When the train was far away, the headlights were shining at me. Well, guess what? I thought that was a long presentation, but it turns out it's not so long after all. So I hope, um, I hope you learned something, those 18 tips, before, during, and after. If you have any ideas for more tips that I might have forgotten, because this will be an evolving program. Yes? A friend of ours uh, <coughs> goes to any tourist area. He always goes to the gift shop first and looks at all the postcards. That's a great to, idea. To get ideas of where to stand. Yes. Part of the research, I guess. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Who does that? Uh, Gary Shaffer. Oh, OK. You can also go online and look at, you know, click at images. Next. Can you repeat that? Sorry, we didn't hear that. She said that a friend, a friend of ours, when he goes to a place, a new place, he goes to the gift shop, first thing he does, and looks at the pictures, postcards that the gift shop is selling. Uh -huh. And that gives you an idea of what kind of pictures you can take in that place. Uh, Questions? Yes? I just wanted to reiterate that talking to the uh, park rangers at any place that has park rangers is always a great tactic. I find that they are almost all either amateur photographers or in some cases, you know, they license, uh, there's a specific Rainier park ranger who made an enormous amount of money with a really great sunrise picture of Mount Rainier that got reprinted on calendars and so forth. And that has led to <laughs> park rangers all trying to get the perfect shot of Mount Rainier. And so they all know where to take pictures. Whether they'll share that with you or not, I don't know. Right, remember. so here he emphasized the tip of Asking people knowledgeable like the park rangers to give you tips for the best place to photograph the sunset in a given location. Uh, the Nashville Hyper Stereo seemed like it was HDR. Were you doing tone mapping on that? Which which one? The Nashville Hyper Stereo. The bridge. In Nashville. Oh, in Nashville. Well, this is my iPhone, so. I might have, no, I wasn't doing anything special, I don't remember. I tried to improve it a little bit. 
it wasn't necessarily HDR, but might look like this because of a little bit of tweaking. Also, when you crop some of the stereo pairs, it seemed like they projected in front of the screen rather than behind the screen. This is called the stereo window, and you have control over this. You can place, you can move your subject to come forward, out of the screen, or behind. So with a little bit of experience in stereo photography, you start to realize how to adjust this. Normally, everything should be behind the window, behind the screen, but if something is at the center and can be pushed forward, that's a good effect. So in the picture of Vinny, that I have the portraits, I make it come a little bit closer, maybe going through the window. But you control this. It's not fixed when you take the picture. It's part of the post-processing. Instead of automaking, you use the arrows, and that moves things back and forth. And when you're satisfied, then you save it. <laughs> Are there yes. any specific um, tweaks that you tend to do to photos to improve them You know, in terms of just simple contrast, color type of things that you do all the time that people should think I'm about? I'm not a big uh, Photoshop user. I do basic things. I don't know much. I prefer to actually take pictures than manipulate them later. I just look at it. If it looks a bit dark, you know, I adjust and increase the... Uh, Subtle brightness, whatever you know, and basically a lot of the time they use photos of elements. Photos of elements, there is a function that sort of fixes or whatever, all the thing, it does everything the program things need to be done, and you can actually adjust the degree of that. So, I do this, I say, Do I like this? Yes, no, maybe I increase the sharpness a little bit. I'm not the right person to uh, talk about this, but there are other people knowledgeable, and there are other workshops talking about using Photoshop to improve your pictures. A question, when you have the correct deviation on your photo and you crop it, does that change? Yes, the deviation? it does, it does. Now how does it change it? <laughs> it? Normally it increases it because when you crop and enlarge, you enlarge everything including the deviation. So when I say I increase the deviation, I enlarge by four times, the deviation was also increased by four times. But maybe when I enlarge, I crop the bottom, and the bottom was contributing to the deviation. So I've noticed from personal that most of ordinary pictures, as you enlarge, the deviation stays in control because at the same time you're removing things that are close, okay? okay. But that's not necessarily true. When you photograph fireworks, just the fireworks, the more you crop, the more the deviations to be increased because the near and far objects are still in the picture. So any enlargement enlarges the deviation. So it's a little bit complicated, but in general, if you crop and enlarge, the deviation most likely will increase. How do you get the, the form to tell you the deviation? Well, I'm using this app, 3D Steroid, and if you hit alignment, after you take the pair, it will show you the deviation. It, I thought it used to show you all the time, but now you have to hit alignment, and this is deviation 2% or whatever. I aim for uh, <coughs> around 2%, exactly because I might crop later, and that will increase it. Now, as I said, it depends what you do. In stereo projection, deviation is important, but people posting pictures on Facebook when you look at, most people look at small pictures, then deviation is not that important. Actually, they want to have more depth in the picture. So it depends a little bit on your viewing method, what's good and what's not. But as a judge, when I see a picture it has 10% deviation, I cannot even fuse it. That kind of upsets me. And I don't know how these people actually looked at their image. You see, they're, maybe they're not aware of the problem. So I'm trying to make people aware that the judge might be seeing things a little bit differently than you are. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Had the right flowers for not is time 
Why, I can visualize such happy hours close by your side. The honeymoon in store is one that you'll adore. I'm gonna take you for a ride. I'll go home and pack my clothes. You'll get your these and those, and away we'll go. On off we're gonna shuffle, shuffle off to Buffalo. To Niagara and a sleeper, there's no honeymoon that's cheaper, and the train goes slow. On off we're gonna shuffle, shuffle off to Buffalo. Someday the stock may pay a visit and leave a little souvenir, just a little cute. What is it? But we'll discuss that later, dear. For a little silver quarter, we can have the Pullman Porter turn the lights down low. On off we're gonna shuffle, shuffle off to Buffalo. 